Greetings all, welcome to Q&A number 18 where I answer your insightful and incisive questions. Mainly if you're a Patreon, but I do take other questions from other sources such as lower tiers or YouTube comments or Facebook or you know, anything else that looks like it really is a good question worth answering. And I am going to start with revisiting previous videos. First, with respect to the one about commissioning, one detail about officering, which I left out, which is brought up in comments, was the bit about having trust in delegation. This is true. One of the big problems which a few officers have, especially prior NCOs, is that once the instructions have been passed down by you, you have to let the subordinates get about their jobs without harassing them for reports every five minutes or getting in their way, which also is a job for young lieutenants, as I was reminded by a friend of mine. If you're not comfortable in letting others do that, well, then you're not going to do very well as an officer. Going back to the Q&A video, it seems a lot of folks are missing the point I was making about ladders. Yes, I know that they are terrible cars, hence the jokes. And yes, I know that oftentimes the only reason they are still running is because folks can't afford anything better and they are often bodged together. That's the point though. In the real world, budgets and sustainment limitations are a thing. A vehicle which cannot keep operating in the environment, either because it cannot be repaired with the tools at hand or because it cannot be acquired in the first place because it's so expensive, is not a good vehicle for your situation. Also, there is a reason I put the Lancia Beta up as a comparison vehicle. It had a reputation, and yes, I know there is an asterisk with that as well for simply rusting away so badly that there would be no frame left to repair, uh, to replace the parts onto. Anyway, on with the questions. And Pickle Jars for Hillary wants to know if Guinness is actually a decent drink. And we are asking the penetrating questions here. It depends on your taste. I personally prefer lagers over ales, which means that my preferred Guinness product is actually harp. I will say that nothing goes down faster in a drinking race than Guinness, and plenty of other people like Guinness, so it's obviously not bad. Uh, they do say, though, that Guinness does not travel well. The taste of the stuff found outside of Ireland is not the same as you would get in country. I should add that my dislike for ales apparently is not well shared in the US in general, uh, where we have this microbrewery trend uh, kicking into gear. Uh, but apparently because ales are easier to make than lagers, uh, they're all making ales. And I have been to places that do not offer lagers at all. And if you want a bit of trivia, see if any, you find anybody that drank bro, which is the white Guinness. It's kind of like a beery lemonade or lemonadey beer. There's a reason it didn't last long. Sam, have I trained with other nations' militaries? Not to any great extent. I participated in an exchange program with the Royal Essex Yeomanry. Uh, first, they sent a lieutenant over to us, where we were quite bemused by the rather formal radio telephone procedure, such as saying, hello, to start a conversation on the radio, or out to you, to end it. Then, a few months later, I went the other way. Now, unfortunately, the exercise I was to go for got cancelled, so I started doing some touristing to places like Warminster Training Centre, a bit of time in the Challenger 2 simulator, going to Lulworth, or hanging around for a fascinating public relations event named Executive Stretch, which is kind of like those, uh, you know, those work team building themes? Uh, except instead of going to a spa or a golf course, uh, these usually employers of reservists, and they go down to the training area and you basically give them rifles and as much ammo and pyro as they can shoot and throw in the training area. Uh, it's a brilliant idea, actually, I have to say. Uh, but outside of that, there wasn't anything to the trip. We also had a course of instruction by British cadre and counterinsurgency operations when we got to Kuwait. Instructors in leadership or technical courses are often on exchange, but that's not quite the same thing since the visiting foreign instructor still has to teach the American doctrine. And of course it was working operationally with the French army in Afghanistan. A good bunch of guys who wanted the fight, but were more limited by the politicians apparently than by capability or enthusiasm. Apparently I have an opportunity to work with either the French or the Brits in a big multinational exercise in a couple of months. We'll see what comes of it. I suspect I'll be put in with the French simply because there is something of a dearth of francophones in the US Army. Uh, I have my 
technical dictionary. It's over there, ready to help me out. Something I discovered in Afghanistan was that the French that I learned when living in Belgium actually didn't have a great practical utility for coordination of tactical military operations. For some reason, the verb just never really came up. However, if anyone watching this happens to know somebody in the British Army coming to Texas soon, if you could have them fill a rucksack with almond fingers and drop them off with me, I would appreciate it. My normal log pack run once or twice a year to Tesco's got interdicted by COVID and my supplies ran out months ago. He also wants to know what are my thoughts on Canadian forces' a choice of armour. Well, now that they've gone back to having proper tanks after that horrible little moment when it looked like they'd be gone entirely, better. It's not as if they're in bad company with the choice of Leopard 2, especially given the cost that they were going for. The LAV upgrades will give a reasonable light armour capability for the future for their cost, but I am really not convinced by the TAP-V, the Tactical Armoured Patrol Vehicle. I think it might be overkill for the internal security rear zone security role, and it seems a bit big for the recon role that I hear it's being placed into. I await comments from the users, but thus far the limited feedback I've received from two operators has involved the word garbage. James Kachman, for tank infantry cooperation, what are the differences when the infantry's transports are APCs versus IFVs? Now, unfortunately, I do not seem to be able to find a copy of FM 711 or Dash 2 sufficiently old that dates back to the early 80s before the M113 was replaced by the Bradley, so I cannot give you the doctrinal answer. However, I've had, had, had uh, discussions with folks in other militaries, and the bottom line seems to be not so much that there's a difference in the doctrine as there is a difference in the amount of forces used. With an APC, or at least an unstabilized IFV, it is necessary for other vehicles to cover the advance of the carriers that are closing until they get close enough to dismount. So this can be done, this overwatch, by either additional tanks or IFVs. If you have unstabilized IFVs, you can, if you wish, advance in bounds with half of the IFVs on the move and the other half stationary covering them. But that still halves your available firepower, which has to be made up elsewhere. It also means that you are providing only half the amount of targets to shoot at in that last closure phase. The actual methodology, though, I can't see as being massively different. So it would be a case of providing, say, two platoons of tanks to cover the advances of an APC company as opposed to providing one platoon of tanks for uh, IFVs and letting the IFVs basically cover themselves. Arguably, also, there is the issue that there may be targets which are masked from covering fires and they must be dealt with by the assaulting force and not supporting ones. This means either driving tanks in with the APCs or progressing more slowly and letting the better suited dismounted infantry deal with the problems that a caliber 50 or 14.5 just can't deal with. Jens Beckmann, which German tank would I prefer to command on the Eastern Front? The problem with this question is that we have the benefit of hindsight. This is also not the same question as saying, what is the best tank? We know that the chance of a German tanker living to the end of the war, which would be his personal goal in most cases, are pretty slim. In this case, things like the kill-death ratio are totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the German crew killed 25 enemy crewmen before dying, they are still dead, and as a personal career goal, that is a bit of a bummer. As a result, at the time, I would have probably been quite happy with a Tiger or a Panther, at least in the periods of time that they were operating. With the benefit of hindsight, something more like the light tank Lux, a recon vehicle, which kind of suits me as a cavalryman anyway, whose primary weapon is the radio and which is not intended to get stuck in a fight. Scruffy. What has been the biggest inconsistency I found in One Nation's archives when doing research? Well, since I tend to hang out in the technical sections, not operational ones, there's actually a lot less room for variance. I mean, there aren't really all that many different figures you can get for measuring Panther's frontal armor. That isn't to say, however, that there aren't variances between required specifications, design specifications, and practical specifications, especially during development periods. As a result, in my book, when I've taken data from an as-measured report, I also include the date that those measurements were taken because they could change in the course of the vehicle's development and career.
I have found instances of documents being purported to be as is specifications when in fact the document was really using design specifications and unfortunately the only way to discover this is either by finding a different document elsewhere in the archives which contradicts it which actually isn't too uncommon or by just simply going to a real one and measuring it. Then there are the parochial wars, particularly between army ground forces and ordnance branch, which didn't necessarily see eye to eye on all matters. Now this isn't so much inconsistencies in this case, because you know, hard dates or facts given in the accounts from either branch are normally reliable, but it's more of a matter of the interpretation of the situation usually to make the other branch look like they were the ones that were incorrect in decision making or to make one's own branch look good. I've got a bunch of articles transcribed from Army Ground Forces, Armoured Board and Ordnance Archives uh, written up on my Chieftain's Hatch series on the World of Tanks site. John Brophy. To the casual observer, it seems that after North Africa the major Allied armies didn't go for disruptive camo patterns on AFVs as much as the Germans did, going instead for all green colour schemes. Was this actually the case and why? Oh, yes it was. Uh, normally, if you see a picture of an Allied tank in a camo pattern, you can go down to telling which unit the tank belonged to because sometimes specific units would use a pattern. Apparently, the main British disruptive pattern for Europe, introduced by 1942, was MTP-46, and it was intended primarily for effectiveness against air observation. As it turned out, air observation was far less of a problem than not being properly seen by the air, so not only was the point of the disruptive camera reduced, but they also needed to kill the point entirely by painting big white stars and circles on the roof. By and large, other than whitewash in the winter, the Americans couldn't be bothered. Either because it also was most effective against aerial observation, or they just didn't want to spend the man hours doing it. Indeed, about the most famous example of American vehicles with disruptive camo is the use on some M18s early in their service in Italy. I suspect, however, that it was a matter of the M18s being delivered in the two-tone paint. Note how the test M18 that was used for the 90mm turret in Aberdeen was one which was two-tone, and I find it unlikely that they brought one back from Italy that had been painted over there. FM 5-20B of 1944 spends all of one page out of 58 discussing the painting of disruptive pattern camo on a vehicle in temperate zones. On the other hand, the Germans had a very significant aerial observation problem. If that indeed is the primary purpose of disruptive pattern camo in World War II, that would be a good explanation of why the Germans went to the effort and the Allies didn't. Note, I don't know enough about the Soviet position on camo in the mid to late war period in order to make a statement as to their reasons, but like other nations, by the end of the war, disruptive pattern seems to have been less common indeed which does beg the question of what the Marines and Army in the Pacific were doing, as air observation was hardly a major factor for them either. And apparently it was a reflection of where the tactical fighting was. Originally, the Japanese were fighting mainly on the beaches. All of drab vehicles tended to stand out against a sandy beach with a tropical blue sea behind them, so they started adding sand to the vehicle or haze grey. Then the Japanese started putting little beach resistance and waiting until the Americans came inland, making the sand a little bit obvious in the jungle. This meant going back to green. And eventually you end up seeing a bit of a split of standard olive drab and oxide red and sand as sort of a compromise for most eventualities. My recommendation, if you really want to find out what, where and when colors were used, uh, hang out on scale model forums. It's a matter of ridiculously detailed commentary. Loch Ness Hamster. Hello again. Uh, there are photos of armoured trains with tank turrets mounted on them. Are there any accounts of armoured trains used versus tanks or other AFVs? Not really. The trains tended to be for internal security or indirect fire roles. If you think about it, there's something of a really big, easy to hit target, not really suited for engaging tanks except under really unusual circumstances. I am not going to give a flat statement that it never happened. I know better than that, 
much like tanks and ships aren't normally supposed to engage each other, uh, but they did. And I have to admit, I'm a, a bit of a loss to think of a single incident. If anybody knows, feel free to mention in the comments. Oh, speaking of, I have been reminded in comments from the previous video of an incident on Tarawa, where an M4 named Cecilia took a hit on the end of the gun tube by a Japanese tank with a 37mm gun. Fragments came down the tube, through the open breech block, and bounced around inside the turret. Nobody was hurt, but the gun was out of the fight. Admiral Tiberius! How would German AFE production numbers have looked had they only produced Panzer III, IV and associated variants rather than also producing Panther, Tiger, etc? Not suggesting that it would have made a difference in the outcome, just wondering could they have produced more? This strikes me as being the sort of question which can only be answered by pulling a figure out of the fourth point of contact. As is generally well known, the cost of the Panther in terms of Reichsmarks wasn't far off the cost of the Panzer IV. Given that the Panther would have used more resources, like steel, to make a bigger tank, the obvious implication is that the true cost of the Panzers is really in the man hours and the skill sets required to build the things. Or, if placed another way, on a ton for ton basis, Panther was more efficient to construct than Panzer IV. So disregarding the other arguments, like where does one get the extra crew or fuel or whatever, there seems to be much less of an argument for saying that they could have produced more Panzers than Panthers, at least once they've gotten past the time costs inherent in setting up the new production line. So by and large, I'd say that the answer to how many more earlier Panzers could be built than Panthers would be answered by how many Panzers were built in the time it took to convert production lines to the new tank. That said, I am not sure that that argument holds as much weight when one looks at uh, King Tiger and the like, which cost in Reichsmark terms about three times the cost of a Panther. Spencer Loper. Can the Albonian armoured force be saved from its sabotage, or at least the damage mitigated, much as an attempt was made for their small arms inventory? This question was coming, you knew it. Not so much at least certainly not in the short term. You can't exactly grind away a half inch of armor or easily rechamber a tank cannon like you can with the small arms guys. I also chose some of those tanks due to the lack of effective upgradability. So anyway, let's assume that it is now a year later, 1947, and I am now my replacement for my, previ uh, my predecessor who was a traitor. So to go down the list, self-propelled anti-aircraft gun that was the centaur aa the obvious move here is to convert it to the meteor engine to make as many comet type modifications to the hull and running gear as possible not only will this increase reliability it'll also add commonality with other vehicles spgs the 150 millimeter hull row being basically an artillery piece plonked onto the hull the obvious solution here is to put a smaller gun on it like the american 105 this will help the traverse elevation problems dramatically, as well as reduce the ammunition supply problem. Hopefully, Artillery Branch has also chosen the same gun. If whatever Artillery Branch chose doesn't fit well onto this chassis, then we will have to revisit the problem. It may be beneficial to re-engine the vehicle as well to make it petrol and bring it back into commonality with most of the rest of the Army's fleet. For an APC, I had selected the C-15TA, a Canadian 4x4 truck. There is nothing I can think of which can be done to help this problem. The chassis is fine. If Logistic Branch hasn't bought all of the trucks it needs yet, it may be most effective to simply de-armor the things, turn them into flatbed soft-skin trucks, and use them in that role, and then buy entirely new APCs. I don't think that vehicle can be fixed, though. Similarly, the Jagdtiger is equally problematic. I would attack the superstructure with an acetylene torch, or at least the roof, much of the sides and the rear, in order to start to reduce the weight problem. The 128 will have to go as well, partially to find a lighter gun and partially to get something smaller with smaller ammunition. Unfortunately, 20 pounder is a year away yet. The three remaining candidates really are the Soviet 100mm rifle or the American 105 or long 90mm from T32. 
I'm inclined to go with the 100mm for ease of handling. Uh, plus, with the knowledge of future hindsight, uh, we know that the gun will receive much development of ammunition. Frankly though, there is something to be said for just scrapping the things and buying Avengers for the engine commonality or SE100s for the gun. For the light tank, I selected the Harry Hopkins. Probably the best thing to do with this is to simply lop off the top and use it as a turretless recon vehicle, much like some Stuarts found such a role. Forget the gun, just put a caliber 50 on a pintle. To the surprise of some, I picked IS-3 as the best, worst heavy tank. The obvious solution here is to do exactly what the Soviets did to their IS-3s when they discovered they built a lemon. And they spent an additional quarter million rubles per tank, which already had cost a third of a million, trying to fix it. The upgrade program did not hit the field until 1948, but let's presume that the Albonian procurements folk have contacts with the Russians and they know that there is an ongoing project to fix the tank, which has started in 1946. The only other thing I might do would be to see about regunning the 122 with the same 100mm as was going on the Agtiger, but that does eliminate the doctrinal point of the heavy tank with the big HE gun, as well as add even more cost to the upgrade, so yeah, probably not. An interesting question is whether or not there was a suitable engine which can be put into the IS-3 to replace a diesel with something petrol. The only obvious contender is the Maybach being used to haul the Jagdtiger around, if it can be made to reasonably fit into the IS-3's engine compartment. The medium tank though, if I say so with little modesty, I royally screwed them on. As I said in the original video, there is pretty much no upgrade potential here. And being the medium tank it is also probably the most numerous of the vehicles listed. Honestly, the best advice I could give the Albonian Armour Corps would be to immediately mothball or sell half the tanks if they could find a buyer, give half the rest to the reserves, and use the money saved to prioritize a new medium tank purchase in a couple of years over most anything else in the Army's wish list. Which, in hindsight, is good because it means you can get Centurion. Or T-55, I guess. Timo Fiebig. Which uniform or tank color scheme do I find the prettiest? I've always had a bit of a soft spot for the MERDC Summer Verdun. Uh, no particular preference on uniform. Bruce Beckwith. If the water tank subterfuge had not occurred, what would tanks have been called? Well, the original term was, according to Apocrypha, water carrier not water tanks, so obviously the vehicles, WCs, were to be called toilets. Armoured cars, uh, well, they never got a name other than armoured cars, so armoured tractors or armoured gun platforms seems to be the logical answer if one avoids land ships, land ironclads, or whatever. It might be worth looking to see what other countries have started calling the things if they don't use the word tank. Jordan Duchenne. Two questions on auto-loading main guns. One, can the auto-loading gun unload around? It depends on the exact gun and auto-loader in question. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, which also applies to manual as well. Uh, either way, it's not a significant issue. If it can't be unloaded automatically and if you're in a hurry, just pull the trigger. It's what we do with manually loaded guns anyway. If you're not in a hurry, it doesn't matter if you have to use the manual extraction system. Do. In the event of a failure, is there a manual backup? In the vast majority of cases, yes, there is some way of getting around into the tube. Oscar Larson, how is a tank ace defined? I don't know if there's an official definition. The Air Force type definition of five kills doesn't really apply when you're looking at targets which range from towed guns to tanks. Generally speaking, you're just going with someone who is much better at tank fighting than most of his peers. Maraxis, can I briefly describe the development of the organization of armored units at the tactical and strategic level and recommend books on the topic? No, certainly not briefly. But actually, in general, not really anyway. There are certainly various papers out there as uh, how, for example, battalion structures change, how platoon structures change, and the issues of, well, let's say, divisional organization, like we went from square to triangle to pentomic. Uh, that's also given a brief mention that level in a couple of books. But I have to say, I'm actually not aware of any books which give an in-depth assessment of just why 
for example. US tank platoons went from five tanks to four. If anyone has any suggestions on where to look for such a book, throw them in below. Steve Doucet. What's the deal with the swing out rubber panels on T-72s? He's referring to the Fishgill armor. And the idea is that most impacts would probably come from the front quarter. Uh, but some might still be sufficiently oblique that the thinner side armor would be impacted instead of the front. The gills provided a fair bit of standoff distance for an incoming anti-tank missile, or if really lucky, might stabilize an AP round, or destabilize, sorry. Uh, but I personally doubt that. The problem was that they were terrible to keep attached to the tank in the field, and they made the tank even wider for the purposes of any narrow passages so they were quickly dispensed with and eventually replaced with side skirting with ERA. Jeffrey Bangle, does adding extra infantry or equipment on the top of the tank cover air intakes and result in problems? Yes, is the short answer. So when you're putting stuff on the engine deck, just make sure that you leave airflow clear. Normally the intakes are pretty obvious. Pat Fay. How will Armoured Doctrine evolve to deal with the drone threat? I don't think it will. I think anti-air doctrine and equipment will evolve. So far, we're looking at hard kill systems, laser systems, and jamming systems. There may also be an adaptation of active protection systems on the tank to aim upwards at reasonably slow incoming targets. It is certainly a topic which has been interesting the US Army now for a couple of years. The recent fund in Nagorno-Karabakh has brought the issue more into the public eye, but it's not a new consideration for the Army at large. I presume other nations have similarly putting some thought into the matter. Commissar Carl. On the Tank Archives website, they recently posted an article where some tank regiment commander asks if the azimuth indicator and chronometer for indirect fire support can be removed from the T-3476. The crews were not trained for this and any indirect fire mission will be better handled by towed and SP artillery. Let the tanks perform the intended tank role. How was it on other fronts? Well, there obviously is some utility for the concept because tank destroyers certainly were used in the indirect fire role. I am not aware of any cases where 75 or 76 millimeter US tanks were being used for the role in World War II, but I've not looked. Certainly, there are pictures of American tanks being used in the indirect fire role in Korea. The primary use for these azimuth and elevation indicators, though, is really for night fire, not indirect fire. So when you're going into your lager position, before it gets too dark, you draw yourself out a range card. On it, you plot likely targets, such as a gap between houses or a creek bed or you know, something like that. And you aim at them as if you were gonna engage a target at that location. As you take aim, you note down on your card the exact azimuth and elevation displayed. So if you need to engage a suspected enemy in one of those likely target zones, you fire by instrument. Match up the figures on the range card to the figures on your chronometer and azimuth indicator. Fire a burst, maybe do a little bit of zigzagging, get a, get a spread. Later, as night imaging became more capable, the primary use turned out to be on firing ranges. So when somebody fired around outside of the range fan, for whatever reason, they want to know where the round landed. So they would send the master gunner out with the firing tables to look at the measurements of the tank's gun and do whatever the arcane calculations are that he does. I never understood the point of this myself because if the round landed somewhere important, we figured we'd probably hear about it on the telephone soon enough when somebody would call to report a tank round in a Chevy or something. And if it didn't land anywhere important, who cares? However, in theory, indirect remained a thing through the days of the 105 cannon. With the 120 on the M1 and not having a high explosive round, there seems to have been little point in teaching indirect to the troops. Now, I, I should just clarify that for, for the few who don't realize that the M1 now can fire a German HE round, but when it enters service, it was just heat and sabre. I should also add that only the Marines bought it, so now the Marines don't have the tanks. I don't know if the Army's going to buy that round or not. Caleb Engelhart. Uh, what was the first tank wider than one man to have a centrally located driver? 
After doing some digging, at least with regards to production vehicles, with a centrally located driver as we would ordinarily imagine a hull, it seems to be a tie between the PT-76 and the M48, both of which entered service in the early 1950s. Panzer 61 will probably come next. There is a major caveat. Note the position of the driver on the M2 medium tank, and similarly note where he is on the M3 as well. Now obviously this isn't quite the same thing as one central man in the hull, which I think is where your question was going, but it does meet the literal requirement of your question. Why eliminate the bow gunner so quickly after World War II? Well, firstly, the bow mount was a weak point in the armor. Secondly, ammunition was starting to get sufficiently large that either the bow gunner or some ammo capacity had to go. Thirdly, why use five men per tank where you can get away with four? So, for whatever reason, the insistence that ETO had for the bow gunner went away shortly after the war. Not immediately after, though, because you'll see the M47 still has it. Mav Manish. I've mentioned I play DCS, which modules? I own more than I've played thus far, uh, though I've certainly tried a bunch. I'm very much enjoying the Iroquois, and I'm spending my time on the F5 right now. On the next free to try event, I'd highly recommend you look at the Vegan. It's a fascinating aircraft considering the age, uh, but in my case, I think it's the Mi8 next. Hammer of Terra. How would I deal with an enemy vehicle I came across but couldn't confirm it had been knocked out or abandoned? It's a very situation-dependent sort of answer, but the safest thing to do is just put a round into it. One thing I wouldn't do is dismount to have a look inside. Both because of health reasons and also simply because somebody might shoot me. If it's worth checking to see if it's actually abandoned, it's probably just worth putting a 120 into and doing it the easy way. No walking. Josh Heinz, would I use Operation Fortitude inflatables as Christmas decorations? Probably. Actually, I might try to find some excuse to leave it outside for much of the year just to annoy the HOA. I got an assegram from them about painting the trim on my house. I mean, okay, yeah, I was, I was going to get around to it this year anyway. It does need painting, but I could have done without the do this in 10 days or else language. Robert Henry Ilston. How were the American-made tanks, such as the Sherman variants, incorporated into the logistics supply of the Allies? Did the traditional armoured units of England and the Commonwealth keep their existing British tanks and the Americans go only to the new units for the war effort? Or were units supplied with whatever was available at the time? It seems to be a case of whatever was available at the time. For example, if you read Mark Urban's The Tank War, he focuses on the complete wartime history of 5th RTR, a pre-war tank unit which landed in France in 1940 equipped with Mark VI lights and the A9 through the A13 cruisers. By the time they got to the desert, the lights were gone, and that was only cruisers. After a while, they were to trade the cruisers for Matilda IIs, but that lasted no longer than training before they were told to hand them over and to take M3 lights instead. Uh, by the way, Urban's book matches with Crisp's book in attributing honey to one of the American representatives. Then, the next time they were drawn out of the line for refit, they received two squadrons of Grants, keeping one squadron of Stuarts for the lighter recon roles. 5th RTR then started to receive Shermans, but not enough to replace all the Grants, at least not initially. The Stuarts ended up being replaced by Crusaders also smaller and faster than the Shermans, so for a bit of a recon roll. They then left all their tanks behind in Italy, given to the Canadians, and the troops sailed to the UK without the tanks, where they were again completely re-equipped. This time the available tank was Cromwell, but because A30 wasn't around yet, they got Sherman Fireflies as well. They finished the war with that lot. On the other hand, the Polish army had to trade in its Fireflies for 76mm Shermans because for whatever reason, although originally equipped by the British, attrition replacement was being handled by the Americans. The Americans, not having any stocks of Fireflies of their own, had to replace the British equipment with American. As an aside, I do wonder if this sort of thing it might be the reason for the small order of Fireflies placed by the US Army towards the end of the war. Charles Adams and I keep thinking of a destroyer, I've been playing way too much Harpoon. Going way back in history, what are my thoughts about the Hussite Wars and the use of the war wagon? 
I don't have any thoughts on that war at all. I have never given it an ounce of attention. There's only so much time in the day and only so much room in my head. For those who are not aware, the Hussite war wagon is often considered to be the first tank, being as it is an instance of mobile protective firepower. That said, I am led to understand it was really more of a portable pillbox than a weapon of maneuver, so I'm not sure how much I accept the theory that it actually is the first tank. Charles does state it was used in mobile action, but given that the wagon still gets to be hauled around by horses, it seems that they can be mobile or protected, but not necessarily both at the same time. So no recommendations for the Battle of Kuttenberg. Anybody more interested in ye olden stuff with a suggestion, feel free to comment below. Even Williams, were there armored clashes in the early battles of the war in the Dobas? And if so, is that the most recent tank battle? I don't believe so, though honestly I've not looked very hard into it. I wouldn't be surprised if some tanks actually crashed in Syria, but I suspect those wouldn't so much count as tank battles as engagements which happen to involve tanks on both sides. I have a feeling that the last organized armor versus armor or tank versus tank maneuver fight, as we might acknowledge it, actually dates to the 2008 South Ossetia War. I think there were one or two armored clashes there. George Wood. Do I plan to, or would I like to, go back and do full inside the hatches in any vehicles I looked at with Sophie Line? Well, yeah, if I haven't done one, I'd love to. It's down to time, really. As it is, I have sufficient numbers of places to go and vehicles to film to last me well into next year, once, of course, traveling is open for business. Again, with COVID restrictions. That and the amount of vacation time I have available, which isn't much. I do need to reserve some time for actual vacation, and I also need to double dip a bit when I go off with the army. Andrew, if the Cold War went hot in the mid to late 1960s, who would have fared better in tank-on-tank -tank engagements? Probably NATO. I believe that the time of highest threat was actually in the mid-1970s to the early 80s, before the current generation of equipment started to come online for NATO. And even at that, the arrival of 105mm DU ammunition would have been handy. I don't think folks give T-64 and T-72 the credit for the amount of armor that the things had for the time. Yeah, sure, they were sliced up by 120mm MA-29A1 depleted uranium rounds in 1991, but that means nothing when you're talking about a time when the only 120mm gun was the British one and a few German ones starting to come online. However, in the mid or late 1960s, we're talking T-55, some T-62s and T-10s, whilst the proliferation of the real Soviet tank killers, the missiles, hasn't hit yet. By the time you get to the mid-1970s, this has changed. George Paramore. The 17-pounder was known for excessive blast and blinding muzzle flash. What was done with the 20-pounder to fix this? Probably a scientific assessment and analysis of the right amount of powder to be placed into the gun, so as most of it is burned by the time the projectile reaches the end of the barrel. Honestly, I don't know for sure. Sir John Bryan. Will the Aberdeen tank collection ever be seen by the public again? Ever? Probably. Soon? No. The Aberdeen collection was, at the time, split into three sections. There was the mile of tanks, which was a series of tanks on a central divider on the main road. I'm told that they were removed because drunk drivers kept crashing into them and dying. Then they were stuck in open storage in a back field. There was the field of tanks, which was something of a national travesty with tanks sitting in the open to the elements of the North Atlantic coast. And there was a small portion of the collection which was housed inside a building and some of those tanks were, at least cosmetically, in pretty good condition. All of the inside tanks went to Fort Lee. When I last saw them, the collection was housed in some of those semi-permanent rigid clamshell tents. Better than being in the open. Unfortunately, they are on Fort Lee proper and not considered to be publicly accessible. The Ferdinand got shipped to Bobbington for a year and a bit on loan and then got sent home again. The commentary on the Twitter thread when the collection announced its return and then observed it would not be accessible to the public was not positive. Further, there seems little likelihood of this status changing. 
Most of the other tanks were basically sent to the Anniston Army Depot, which is the home of the Center for Military History, and is in open storage there. At least it's in slightly better weather conditions in Maryland. A number of the artillery and ADA pieces instead were diverted to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where they are accessible to the public. Uh, Oklahoma is one of the four states I have not yet set foot in, so you can imagine that accessible may be a relative term. Uh, the other states, by the way, if you're curious, are Vermont, Idaho, and North Dakota. A number of the former Aberdeen vehicles have since been forwarded on from Anniston to Fort Benning, where the armor and cavalry collection is. They, too, are not open to the public, and nor are they likely to be any time soon. However, they have just moved into a new huge hangar, which is being set up for visitors on scheduled open days. So when COVID restrictions lift in the summer, knock wood, watch for dates on their Facebook page. They are mainly putting American vehicles in there, though. Uh, there is a huge reserve collection elsewhere on post. The associated nonprofit seems to have given up in their attempts to fundraise for a proper museum, which was going to be placed opposite the National Infantry Museum. My personal thinking is that they were going for overkill. The Infantry Museum is an outstanding building and collection, and they obviously put no small amount of money into it. However, I personally would be happy with just a massive hangar, four walls and a roof. Or two or three massive hangars, each with four walls and a roof. And an air conditioning system. I do expect the army will have me back in Banning in a couple of months, so I'll try to get an update for Len or Rob then. And guess what? I've done it again. I've gone way long. I am not doing a drac. I am not doing a multiple hour q and I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you sit through it. So I'm going to be breaking this up into two parts again. This ran way long, too many questions, and you're going to get the second half next week. See you then.